On a windy afternoon, a serene coastal landscape in Victoria, Australia, bore witness to a scene that would forever stain the pages of the country's history with unspeakable terror. Perched at the bottom of a cliff, battered and bruised, sat a once-white 1956 Holden sedan with a shattered windscreen and mangled front end. The car bore the scars of a violent collision, hinting at a grim fate that had befallen its occupants. The mysterious murder of this innocent family in 1970 forever stained the pages of Australia's history with unspeakable terror. To this day, Elmer Crawford, the father and husband who brutally took the lives of his own family, is nowhere to be found. The case uncovered a web of secrets, financial motivations, and conflicting desires, leaving authorities and the public captivated by the mystery that still haunts to this day. Welcome back to True Crime Expresso, where we unearth the darkest corners of solved and unsolved crimes and unlock the mysteries haunting our global community. Today, we'll cover the spine-chilling discovery made on July 2nd, 1970, as the lives of pregnant mother Therese Crawford and her three children were tragically stolen in their sleep, leaving behind a cryptic car at the edge of a cliff and a prime suspect who vanished into thin air. Meet Elmer and Therese Crawford, a seemingly ordinary couple residing in Cardinal Road number 136 in the peaceful suburbs of Glenroy, Victoria, with their three children, 12-year-old Catherine, 8-year-old James, 6-year-old Karen, and another member on the way. Elmer Crawford, who was born in Canada, eventually found his way to Australia at the age of 22, leaving behind his roots in Derry, Northern Ireland. Despite lacking formal qualifications as an electrician, he found a telephone technician job at the Victoria Racing Club at Flemington Racecourse the year he immigrated to Australia. He had worked there ever since. Elmer was known as a seemingly normal and friendly man, although he mostly kept his life to himself. There appeared to be no discernible troubles within his domestic life. None of the neighbors of the Crawford family reported seeing or hearing anything suspicious or abnormal in the residence. Little did anyone know that behind this facade of normalcy, a dark and horrible secret was about to unravel. On the fateful morning of July 2nd, 1970, Brenda Connor, a close friend of 12-year-old Catherine, visited the Crawford residence as she usually did. Brenda knocked on the door, expecting to see Catherine, but to her surprise, Catherine's father, Elmer, answered. It struck her as odd, since Elmer Crawford was typically at work by that time of the day. Brenda said she came for Catherine. It was their routine to walk together to school in the mornings. Elmer said that Catherine was not going to school today because she caught the flu. Brenda reluctantly walked away, unaware of the horrifying truth that her beloved friend had become a victim of a horrifying act executed by her own father. That windy afternoon at around 1.30, as waves crashed against the rugged rocks of Loch Ard Gorge near the Port Campbell National Park, an eerie sight caught the attention of sightseers. Perched at the bottom of a cliff, battered and bruised, sat a once-white 1956 Holden sedan with a shattered windscreen and mangled front end. Police were immediately called. Because the position of the car was too risky to be searched right at the scene, the police decided to call in a cliff rescue team. However, they were able to track the owner of the car through the registration plate. When they arrived at the Crawford residence around 6 p.m. that evening, their knocks were left unanswered. The police then started questioning the neighbors. They admitted to having not seen Therese or the children throughout the day. However, Elmer had been seen on the driveway at around 5.30 in the afternoon, merely half an hour before the police arrived. The officers then decided to leave. In initial research, they thought that this was just another suicide that took place frequently in the area. Four hours later, at around 10 p.m., the police made their way back to the family residence. Again, there was no answer. Fearing for the safety of the family, they decided to break into the house, unaware of the horrifying scene that awaited them. The house looked disastrous. Walls splattered with red, blood-soaked beds, and a haunting trail of blood leading from the bedrooms into the kitchen confronted the police. A crucial piece of evidence was also discovered, a 15-meter electrical cord equipped with a plug on one end and an extension cord socket on the other. Attached to the main cord were smaller leads fitted with alligator clips. The significance of this bizarre setup would later become clear. Additional evidence displayed an attempt to conceal the horrors 
as a still foaming bottle of carpet cleaning detergent hinted at an attempt to erase the blood stains. Something horrible had occurred. The findings shed light on the personal life of the Crawford family. A letter from Therese found to her older sister suggested a troubled marriage and a conflict between the couple. Therese, devout in her Catholic faith, found herself at odds with her husband's desire for her to terminate her fourth pregnancy. The morning after, on July 3rd, the police returned to the scene to further examine the car. It was at that moment that they made the shocking discovery. Peering through the windows, they found the back seat missing, replaced by a shrouded tarpaulin and a pile of blankets. Blood stained the dashboard and front seat while a nauseating smell filled the air upon opening one of the back doors. Among the chaos inside the car, a loaded 22 caliber rifle, family photos, and a 15-meter electrical cord with alligator clips raised more questions than answers. A scene as bizarre as it was unsettling unfolded right in front of their eyes. Then they saw the pairs of feet poking under the tarpaulins. There, the lifeless bodies of Therese, Catherine, James, and Karen lay motionless, victims of unspeakable horror. The harrowing details revealed by the autopsies painted a horrifying picture of the victim's final moments. Therese, Catherine, and James were marked by electrical burns on their ears and hands. The alligator clips firmly attached to the electrical cord had been fastened to 35-year-old Therese's ears. Catherine and James were also electrocuted after being assaulted with a sharp implement which caused their fractured skulls. The youngest of them all, Karen, met a horrifying demise. She was brutally beaten to death with a hammer, which was later discovered in the car. But where was the father? As the investigation into the mysterious Elmer Crawford intensified, the tangled web of the family's financial affairs began to unravel. It was discovered that Elmer had been laying the groundwork for his plan for a long time. Unbeknownst to his unsuspecting family, he convinced his wife to update their wills. According to the updated wills, if something was to happen to Therese, Elmer would be granted a substantial fortune, including their residence in Glenroy, $3,000 in cash, and valuable plots of land in Queensland. But the depths of his deceit ran even deeper. Police also found evidence pointing to his illicit activities, as he had been stealing money from his own employer and selling stolen goods. The year after, in 1971, a coroner from Victoria pieced together the chilling events that unfolded on that fateful night. Prior to the murders, Crawford had removed the back seat of the Holden, ensuring an interior big enough for the victims to fit into. On the evening of July 1st, 1970, while Therese, Catherine, Karen, and James were sleeping innocently in their beds, Elmer brutally attacked them. Wrapping their lifeless bodies in blankets, he put them in the back seat. He took a motor scooter, a rifle, a hose, and some fuel cans with him, and then drove for 100 miles to Loch Ard Gorge. When he arrived at the location, he shifted Teresa's lifeless body into the driver's seat and connected the hose to the exhaust and fed it through the window. Leaving the handbrake disengaged, he pushed the car with the hope of disguising the act as a murder-suicide committed by Therese herself. Yet fate, it seemed, had other plans. The vehicle became ensnared on the ledge, defying its intended plunge into the Southern Ocean. Unbeknownst to Elmer, his carefully constructed facade had crumbled, which left a grim tableau suspended above the crashing waves. As the evening wore on, Elmer returned to the scene to clean up the mess he had left behind. As he heard the knock of the police, Elmer remained silent, with his heart pounding with fear. He realized that his carefully executed plan blew up in his face. When the police departed, he seized the opportunity to disappear and to never be seen again. Hours later, the police forcefully entered the deserted home, but they encountered nothing but a haunting emptiness. Elmer Crawford had vanished, leaving behind only unanswered questions and a lingering sense of dread. But what was his motive for brutally murdering his innocent family of five? One prevailing theory suggests that Elmer's rage simmered beneath the surface, ignited by Teresa's refusal to terminate her pregnancy. The unborn child became an unwelcome presence for Elmer, a catalyst for his discontent. The weight of resentment grew, potentially driving him to orchestrate his carefully contemplated plan that would eradicate his entire family. Another theory points to financial problems. It is believed that Therese stumbled upon her husband's illegal activities at work. 
threatened by exposure or the prospect of divorce, Elmer's facade began to crumble, which motivated him to eliminate any potential obstacles standing in his way of getting money. The drafting of new wills shortly before the gruesome murders supports this theory. Amidst the web of motives surrounding the Crawford family murders, another revelation shed light on the discord that plagued the couple's relationship. A half-written letter found in the Crawford residence offered a glimpse into Teresa's turmoil. The letter read, I have been so upset, but what's the use? I am two and a half months now. The aftermath of Elmer's disappearance ushered in a wave of unanswered questions that lingered for five decades. In a bid to locate him, a substantial reward of $100,000 was offered to the public on February 10, 2008, to find potential informants to come forward with any information that could lead to his whereabouts. The authorities suspected that he may have altered his appearance in order to conceal his true identity. Having previously worked as an unqualified electrician, it was plausible that he might have still engaged in similar work even though he would then be of retirement age. If the couple's relationship had indeed crumbled, the stakes for Elmer Crawford would have been extremely high. The prospect of divorce would have jeopardized his position, leaving him much to lose. But no one knows where he ran off to. The nature of his unspeakable act and his mysterious disappearance have elevated Elmer Crawford to the ranks of Australia's most infamous and sought-after suspects. Despite the extensive efforts of law enforcement, concrete leads have been scarce. Among the limited leads, one particularly compelling account emerged in 1994, centered around reported sightings of Elmer in Western Australia. A woman who happened to be holidaying in Perth at the time and was acquainted with Elmer reported not one but two encounters with a man resembling Elmer. The initial sighting took place at a hotel in the Bunbury area, followed by a subsequent sighting at a fast food restaurant in Perth. The woman approached the man at the Bunbury Hotel and asked him whether he was Elmer Crawford. The man said he was from New Zealand and came to Australia for a holiday. The woman, who had known Elmer for a long time, remained steadfast in her belief that he was lying. The encounter left such an impression that a composite sketch was later created based on the woman's description. The case received public attention, particularly on the anniversaries of the gruesome murders. Yet despite these developments and the occasional surge of publicity, the gathered information fell short of providing the breakthrough needed to locate and apprehend Elmer Crawford. The discovery of a body in San Antonio Morgue in 2010 brought a sense of possibility in locating Elmer. The individual, known as Harold Freisinger in Texas, had also used aliases such as Gerald Brown, Roger Smith, and Peter Turner. He had passed away five years prior in 2005 due to a heart attack, collapsing while shopping at a thrift store. The man underwent extreme measures to conceal his true identity by damaging his fingerprints and carrying multiple false documents under various names. Facial recognition technology indicated similarities and matches in height and eye color. However, the hopes of finally locating Elmer crumbled when five years later in 2010, a blood relative of Elmer was discovered in New South Wales. DNA testing conclusively revealed that the man found in the Texas morgue was not Elmer Crawford. In another encounter, a former truck driver named Nugget Wright recalled a conversation he had with a man that left a lasting impression. Nugget revealed that he had met this individual who spoke of a long-gone wife and claimed to have relocated from Melbourne in 1970. When Nugget asked the reason for his abrupt departure from Victoria, the man replied, I had to leave in a hurry. I did something terrible. Nugget vividly recounted the man's reaction after telling him this. He seemed visibly shaken, with his head dropping, shoulders shrinking, and an unmistakable expression of realizing he had divulged too much. Decades have passed since the tragic murders of Therese, Catherine, James, and Karen Crawford on July 1, 1970, yet the investigation remains ongoing. To this day, authorities pursue any leads and actively seek information regarding the current whereabouts of Elmer Crawford, the prime suspect in this long-standing case in Australian history. Now in his 90s, if Elmer were still alive, it seems increasingly probable that his time may be drawing to a close. Individuals who may have knowledge about the current whereabouts of Elmer Crawford are strongly encouraged to come forward and provide their information to Crime Stoppers. 
Among the tranquil breeze in Victoria, Australia, a bone-chilling discovery was made on July 1, 1970, as the lives of pregnant mother Therese Crawford and her three children's lives were tragically stolen in their sleep, leaving behind a cryptic car at the edge of a cliff and a prime suspect who vanished into thin air. The Crawford family murders remain one of Australia's most perplexing and haunting criminal cases. What drove Elmer Crawford into slaying his own family? Where is Elmer Crawford now, if he is indeed still alive? 